Every day, abused and neglected children in our community are removed from their homes because their parents cannot or will not take care of them. A group of volunteers advocate for the best interest of these children. They are ordinary people who do extraordinary things for some of our community's most vulnerable children. How you can become one of them is coming up next on Polk Place. Welcome to Polk Place. I'm Tina Mann, your host, and joining me in the studio today is Diane Schmeltz, the Recruiting Coordinator with the Guardian Ad Litem Program. Good morning. Welcome to this, the show today. Thank you. Glad to be here. All right. For some of us that may not know what the Guardian Ad Litem Program is, why don't you tell us a little bit about it? Okay. Well, we become the voice for children who've been removed from their homes because they've been abused or neglected. Now, we don't remove the children, and we don't have to prove or disprove any of the allegations. So it puts us in a great position. Nobody is upset or angry with us. But we have a couple of roles. One is we step in because the judge appoints us, and he wants us to gather information. He wants us to talk to the children, get to know the kids, talk to teachers, get school records, talk to their doctors, get medical records. Records. Um, they might be with a grandmother. Maybe there isn't a suitable relative and they're in foster care. So we talk to their caregivers. So our guardians gather information from all sources and then they work as part of a team with a coordinator in the office and one of our attorneys to figure out what do we believe is in the best interest of the kids. So we're neutral. We are not for or against anybody else. Our focus is the children and what we think is best for them. Now while we do that, we very often become the one consistent adult in these kids lives. You know, sometimes by no one's fault, placements change. Maybe they're with a grandmother and then she gets gets sick and they have to be moved into foster care. Maybe siblings are separated in foster care. They've already been removed from mom and dad, so it's scary. So to know they have an adult that is the consistency, becomes their friend, somebody they can trust and rely on, someone that makes them feel valued, you know, someone cares about me. Someone knows what's happening. That's just tremendous to be able to do that in a life of a child. So that's basically what our volunteers do. Lots of volunteers start out thinking, oh, this will be too, too emotional. We don't lose volunteers because it's emotional. They realize they're making such a difference with these kids that that is very reassuring. Um, some of our volunteers just take cases where they do the whole Whole, whole gamut. Some just make visits for us. So we are very good about fine-tuning and being flexible with how our volunteers can be part of the lives of these kids without ever overwhelming or having you know too much time that we take from their other family and activities. Yeah. The guardian ad litems were, were created to you know, be a voice for the children when they, they don't normally have a voice in these kind of proceedings. Their opinions aren't always taken into consideration or um, it, it's, a, it's a good thing. Um, I know I have adopted kids, I've had a guardian and, and that was wonderful in place with them. And it's so important that, you know, what you guys do because you allow them to develop a trust relationship with a an adult and a lot of these kids don't have that they Absolutely. they they've lost their trust and mm -hmm. and that that impacts relationships forever so y everything is volunteer based it is yes we do have a staff so we don't just train volunteers and drop them out there in the county we do have almost 1700 children so the need is just exorbitant but we take our volunteers and give them a support system they have their team they also in addition to their coordinator and attorney which are staff positions they get a mentor mentor is another volunteer that says oh I remember those first few steps you know came out of training and, and now oh gosh I have to make my first visit you know it's a little scary so the mentor mentor is another volunteer that's going to walk alongside the new volunteer until they feel comfortable. Make the first visit to grandma's. Go to court with them the first time. Sit and talk about a visit. Okay, did we see this? Did we see that? What about that? Do I need to ask? So again, until the volunteer feels comfortable that, okay, now I've got this. I feel good about it. And they can do it on their own. They've got tremendous support from another volunteer and the staff. Now you mentioned training several times. I know mm -hmm. that they're offered basically monthly. Yes, they are. And what do the trainings 
entail? Well, the training, we, we've got a couple steps to training. The first part of training is doing some at home study. There's videos to watch, there's some re reading material. Second part of training is actually coming into our office. We do two, about three and a half, four hour sessions, and then we actually take the volunteers to court so they can experience watching some court hearings, listening to the judge. Our judge is wonderful, it's Judge Roddenberry. He actually comes off the bench, talks to the volunteers after the hearings, answers questions, does the oath, gets them sworn in. Third part of training is actually in the field as you take that first case and start walking through it with your team. So the team does go with you on the trainings? They do, yes. At first. Yep, yep, when at out first. in the field they do. And as you said, the volunteer becoming such a consistency. I had a situation last summer, I had done an event and it was outside in July, so hot, I was so tired, had almost an hour ride home and I decided halfway I was I was treating myself to a nice coffee, a nice latte. I needed something. I was exhausted <laughs> and hot. <laughs> so I drove through a drive through ordered my coffee, paid the young lady at the window, and as she handed me the coffee, she said to me, you're Diane, aren't you? And I said, yes. And I thought, oh, shoot, who is she? Where do I know her from? I know she's not one of our 800 volunteers, but maybe a speaking engagement I did. She smiled and she said, Miss Diane, you don't recognize me. You were my guardian 13 years ago. Oh, she amazing. was seven years old. She's now 20. And I was only her guardian for about eight months, but she recognized me. And I started as a volunteer a little over 14 years ago. And we, I parked, she came out, we talked. She told me all sorts of things that I had told her 13 years before. You used to tell me this, you used to tell me that, and I thought, wow. If people realized how easy it was to do this, I didn't do anything special. I was just present. I was there. I let her know I cared. And here, then she recognized me. And I even said to her, I said, how did you recognize me? She said, I recognized your voice when you placed your order. It's like, seriously? Through that wow. little box? <laughs> really? But I had made an impression. And that's what all our volunteers are doing. They're letting the kids know they're, they have value. Indeed. That is such an amazing story. My kids, five and a half years later, still talk about Mr. John. Aww. And they still talk about their, their guardian because he was there. And I, I truly believe that he is one of the reasons they were able to bond with me and be, were able to establish that trust because mm -hmm. of him being there. I can't imagine what I would have had to face if he wouldn't have been there. Mm -hmm. um, it, that, I'm, I'm just kind of speechless over your story. Oh. <laughs> um, so how do guardians find, or guardians, potential guardians, find out more about your program? Well, they can, they can always give me a call. Um, my direct line at the office is 863-534-2547. Okay. That comes directly to me. I can give them information. I can send them an application. Um, answer questions and concerns. Everybody has questions and concerns. Safety and time are two of the biggest. Mm -hmm. And we will never ask a guardian to put themselves in any kind of unsafe or even uncomfortable situation. If they're driving down the street to see the children at the caregiver's home and they're thinking, oh, I'm a little worried about the neighborhood, they keep going. We don't want them stopping and going in if they feel uncomfortable. Bring your coordinator, bring your mentor the first few times, or we can see the children at school, or we can go to when, with their caseworker when they're having a supervised visit with the parent. We can go and observe. So lots of ways we can get everything we need accomplished and they're never gonna be unsafe. The other thing is time. Everybody worries about the time. The average case takes somewhere between six and eight hours a month. The beauty is you do it when it works for you. If in a given month you're busy a couple weeks or you're on vacation or you have company, don't do it those weeks. If you get in a pinch that month and you can't make your visit, you're part of a team. Let your coordinator know. They will get things accomplished for you. So it's very, very flexible if, if we communicate. That's the whole thing, is just communicating. They also can go to www.becomeaguardian.com. Mm -hmm. When they fill out a little bit of contact information, it comes right to my computer. So they can email me that way, they can call, so lots of ways they can get connected. So when you are thinking about the ideal volunteer, what traits do you think they would have? Well, it's, it, it's a wide range. <laughs> because we have children from milder neglect to very severe abuse. I look at what gifts and talents are the volunteers bringing. 
what insight do they have from life lessons and experiences that they've gone through themselves? We have volunteers that were children in the system. We have volunteers that were abused as, as children. They have an insight and understanding that we can't teach. We have volunteers that have their GED. We've got those that have their doctorates and everything in between. So we really get to know the volunteer. I do a short, it's called an interview. It's more like a meet and greet. I want to get to know the volunteer so I can do a better job matching you first with your coordinator, who you're going to work hand in hand with, and then the cases we put you on. Because everybody's coming with their own gifts. And boy, if we can match that with the needs of kids, it just works beautifully. And as you mentioned, there are just so many kids out there that are in need of, of help. Absolutely. And they're all over the county. Mm -hmm. A lot of times the volunteers worry, how far will I have to go? And we are very respectful and try our hardest to make it easy for you to make your visits. Sometimes children get moved out of the county. You know, that happens. They would rather place them with a relative maybe in another county or in a foster home that has medical services they need. And it happens. If the volunteer says that's a little too far, we get a volunteer from another circuit mm -hmm. to make the visit. So uh, communication. We can work out anything if we know what the issues are. You guys have a really good program there and, and you guys are really good at communicating so that shouldn't be a worry of anybody no, who no. is thinking about getting involved. So if they're not quite ready to volunteer, is there any other way they can help your organization? Absolutely, absolutely. We have a 501c3, it's called Speak Up for Children, and they accept any donations. They accept toys, gifts, monetary value. A lot of our kids, especially the teenagers, nobody ever knows what to get a teen. <laughs> you know, they just don't <laughs> no, know what, what do they want. A lot of times these kids don't have anyone giving them even a birthday card. Mm -hmm. So if we have some funding to cover some of the things that wouldn't be necessarily covered otherwise, it is wonderful. We have a group that makes baskets, beautiful gift baskets and gift bags for the teens. They've got shampoo and conditioner and special stuff for the kids that make them feel, wow, Gosh, somebody brought me something for my birthday. I was just with a volunteer this past weekend doing an event, and she was helping me. And she is the guardian for a young man. He's 17. He's in a group home, about to age out of the system. But his birthday's coming up. And she said, you know, what do you want for your birthday? And he has nothing. He has, I mean, clothes on his back and a few extra outfits. And he doesn't have a lot of worldly possessions. And she said, you know, this is a big birthday. This is 18. What do you want? And he said, I have more in my life right now than I ever have. I'm fine. It's like, wow, these children are used to not having much, mm -hmm. not getting anything. So when we have a little extra funding or gifts, especially around the holidays, mm -hmm. when we can collect toys and gifts to make sure that these kids have something new and special, that is just wonderful. So again, through our office, we can let people know how to donate. That is amazing. I know. It just you don't even think about the fact that you might not get a present for your birthday no. or Christmas normally, but can, the, imagine the the, the just sadness that that brings when it's supposed to be a happy time. Exactly. Um, and I love how the guardians, they often just, I mean, even after the cases are closed, they continue to follow up and, you know, check on the kids and it everything did. else. It, it really becomes a hard issue. It does. It does. And, and that's why a lot of our volunteers are afraid they'll be too emotional. I've had volunteers that say, my husband's afraid I'm going to want to bring every child home, you know. <laughs> we do find we lose volunteers because it becomes frustrating. The court system, it can be slow. You know, parents have legal rights, be. which is a good thing, but it can be frustrating. But if it's frustrating for us, imagine the children. Mm -hmm. That's when we become even more important because a lot of these kids are going to push away. And you probably know this from your own yes, experience absolutely. adopting three. They are afraid you're going to walk away like everybody mm -hmm. else in my you're life ever has. Now? You're going to let me down. Yeah. So I'm going to push you away before I get attached. But with our guardians, when they finally can break through and the children realize, wow, even when it got bad or even when my behavior wasn't great, you didn't, you didn't waver. You still came back. That, that's a lifelong lesson for these kids to start to learn to trust again. It is, and it's like a light breaking through the clouds. The, yeah. Like the first time that my oldest, who was absolutely adamant, he was never going to call me mom. He was never going to tell me he loved me. The first time he said mom, mm. and the first time he told me he loved me, I will never oh, forget those moments absolutely. because of of how just how how hurt he was and how long it did take mm -hmm. to get through to them. But 
it's worth it if you have oh. patience and you wait. Exactly. So. exactly. And this society where instant gratification, you know, this is not instant. No. The, look at this, you, the young lady, 13 years before I heard the impact I had made. You know, and I really didn't know. I thought, okay, I guess I've done a good job. You know, she's in a better p position now than when she came into the system. But to hear that she remembered, she even remembered my car. She wanted to know, <laughs> what happened to your white convertible? I was like, my word, I sold that about eight years ago. I don't remember the car my parents had when I was seven. But things become so important to these children because they're holding on to anything that gives them any kind of stability. And that becomes their guardian. And it's an amazing program. And thank you so much for what you do. Oh, well, thank you for letting us heighten the awareness. A lot of time people say, oh, I would have done this before, but oh, I thought it would take so much time or I didn't even know about you. So this is a wonderful opportunity. That's awesome. Well, thank you for coming in today. Great. Thank you. Guardian Ed Lydum volunteers advocate for the best interest of these children. Guardians come from all walks of life. No two are alike. Just as each child is unique, so is each guardian. The 10th Judicial Circuit is looking for volunteers. Each circuit program is supported by a local nonprofit organization. The time and money contributed by these local organizations are essential to successfully meeting the needs of its children and volunteers. For more information, give them a call at 863-534-2547 or check them out on the web at www.becomeaguardian.com.